Hello, everyone. We're just going to give it a few seconds for our YouTube friends as we set up a live stream. Just a few more seconds as we get that set up. All right. Hello, everyone. Good day. Um, today's webinar that we have is evidence-based decision-making, leveraging better information and techniques for smarter product discovery. That's by our professional scrum trader, Lavanish Gautam. He's based in the United Kingdom. And my name is Patricia Kong. I'm based in the Boston uh, area in the United States. Um, today, Lavanish is going to keep it very interactive. So I'm excited to see this one because you're 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 building in some interactivity um, to learn from um, our guests and also going to share some experiences of what he's actually done out there in the wild in the field. So he's got that going. So I will uh, get this started. All right. So some quick information here. Um, the microphones of everyone will be muted throughout as usual. This session is recorded. Um, the recording and slides will be up. Um, our colleague Lindsay is here. She'll be helping you with any technical issues, but also um, she'll probably get this up within 24 hours. She's quite quick. Please ask questions. Um, I'm here today, obviously, because this is an evidence-based management kind of conversation, um, but I'll be watching your questions, get that into the Q&A. Um, the chat is nice, but I'll be looking at the Q&A box. So get that in there to ask Lavanish some questions. All right, next. So who are we? We are Swarm.org. Our mission is helping people and teams solve complex problems. We're founded by Ken Schwaber, who is the co-creator of Scrum. And um, our company is focused on training, education, and certification validation. Um, we have a large global community. You can see that so many of our webinars have people coming in from all over and in different languages. All right, so two minutes in, I can kick it off to you, Lavanish, and introduce yourself. Thank, thank you, thank you, Trish. Okay, so uh, guys, so this is Lavanish, and my mission is not very far away from the scrum.org mission itself. It, and it is all about helping people and teams delivering the great outcomes through the products and the services, what uh, they do and how I do that. I am a trainer with the scrum.org, also a trainer with the brookandband.org as well. But apart from the training, I also work as a coach and consultant, mostly in the space of the product management nowadays, uh, and also sometimes as the agile coach and that as well. So feel free to uh, contact me even after the webinar. Uh, you can uh, send me LinkedIn requests. If you have got any questions and all, I'm always and always happy to answer those even after this webinar uh, as well. Okay. So uh, first, uh, something, let's talk about the why. Why are we have chosen this uh, topic itself. That why we need evidence-based uh, decision-making. And... Nowadays, I can see that many organizations, uh, many companies, they are making decisions based on the intuition, the gut feeling itself. Last week, I was, spoke, I was speaking to one of the product manager and uh, we were just having some conversation and he gave me some real life experience that they built a feature uh, with the weeks of worth of effort. So they use, I think somewhere around four and five weeks, they built a feature. And after that, what they learned was that feature was never used by any of the user or any of the customer itself. Then when we started going a little bit deep into it, we learned that that feature was actually was somebody's brainchild, one of the leader's brainchild, and one of the, one of the client, they mentioned it to them, and then they thought all the clients want something like this. They put a pressure, and then we crack on with it. And thing is, this is happening a lot in many places. And this is what we want. And you can see that this evidence-based decision-making is very much like the GPS. Yes, we have got a destination, but sometimes what is the best route to reach to that destination? Sometimes we do not know. And as a, a GPS guide us to how we can reach to our destination in the optimal way by looking into the real-time traffic, which roads are closed, where an accident has happened. It gives us the alternative routes as well. This is what 
pretty much what this evidence-based um, decision-making does. It gives us the data, it gives us the evidence, and then use this data and evidence to find out the best way to reach our product goals, our product vision, and our product strategy. So now I have got one question for all of you because I am making some assumptions here. And I would like to validate my assumption by asking all of you. So the question which I have got is, okay, how the decisions are made in your company, in your organization nowadays, okay? Do you use some kind of data-driven insights uh, using some experiments and all? Or it is through the leadership direction where only selected few take the decision and pass it over to everybody. Or it is based on somebody's gut feeling that, oh, I think this is what we should do or intuition and things like that. How are you guys, how are the decision made in your organization? So please take a little moment. You have got this poll in front of you, participate in that. And then we will see the result and crack on as well. Let, Let's see that our results are validated, our assumptions are validated or not. Which do we know how are people responding to it? Not. Um, I think we're gonna give them some time to clock in, uh, clock in their answer, but I can see some people making jokes. So some people are saying leadership direction, but if you ask them, it's probably gut feel, uh, yes. intuition. So I think Lindsay's driving the pull from behind, uh, the scenes. Okay. Now, what is your assumption, Lavanish? as people are doing that? Uh, my assumption is it is mainly from the B and C and the less from A. I'm not saying that we don't take the evidence-based decision-making at all. Yes, they are, but it is mainly driven by the B and C. That's what my assumption is. Okay. Can you see the results? Ooh, 67 leadership direction, only selected few. They take the decisions, 12% gut feeling, intuition, and the 21%. So pretty much the, our assumption is in the right direction then, isn't it, Trish? Okay. It is. And there's a really fair comment that, um, you know, for some people, it's actually a little bit of all of the above um, because <laughs> you can probably sway data a lot of the time to, to, to say what you want, can't you? Yeah. So that'll be important in your talk. And that probably leads to our second, uh, the first topic, which I will talk about is, which is that what decision make decision we are making as well. Okay because somebody just mentioned that probably it is all three of it, what we just talked about. Actually, when we deliver the value through the products, through the service, we make a lot of decisions, isn't it? On a very high level, we build the vision, strategy, who are the right customers as well, which customers to focus on, which problems of those customers we want to focus on that help us in prioritizing our uh, features, as well, our goals, our roadmaps, whether we should build in-house, whether we should involve somebody outside our company. I think is the product development, the value delivery is filled up with so many decisions. And if we start making decisions just based on selected few and the gut feeling, it leads to a lot of, uh, I would say, rework and the waste in our work as well, where we build things which nobody ever uses as well. And when we do not have the data or the evidence, we make decisions based on cer certain few things. So first is, let's say the gut feeling and the intuition. Some people think, oh, I really want, I think this is the my right target customer. It can go wrong. I give you one real life example here. This copying competitors and the industry trend. Yesterday, I was speaking to one of my friends uh, and in his company history, he told me that they are building one AI chat board. And when I asked him, okay, that sounds cool, but why are you building that AI chat, chat board? They said that, oh, because all of our competitors, they are building it. When I tried to further ask, okay, your competitors are building, but what is your why behind it? 
what problem are you trying to solve through those AI chatbot? I couldn't get a very clear answer. Sometimes we are just following uh, the people itself. Sometimes it's also driven by the urgency. Yeah. And sometimes we can, we can call it as a deadline driven development. And one of the product I was working a couple of years back, we were so much, you can say blindsided by our launch date and the scope that we wanted to meet in our release one that we started ignoring some critical bugs as well. We thought that, oh, we cannot pull out from the release right now. It will not be great for our brand reputation. What happened when we released one critical bug, we, which we deprioritized, it was such a massive impact on the product that after launching the product, two weeks after that, we had to stop the product and we rolled back the release. Probably much more embarrassment in front of our customers, in front of our clients as well. And this is probably, you can say the why we want to take, use the evidence, use the data, build experiments to collect the data rather than just using things like the loudest person or hippos. And people, if you're thinking what hippos are, many times we'd make decision based by highest paid person opinion. Someone who has got the highest job title in the meeting room, they take the decision. And the truth is, Great products are not built in the meeting rooms. They are built and shaped by the conversation with the users and the customers. Because everything is, is an assumption until unless it reaches into the customers and the users' hand. And this is where the product discovery helps a lot. The goal of product discovery is all about building that data, building that evidence, so that it can help us in the decision-making. And probably this is the reason why uh, Scrum.org recently launched this course, product Professional Product Discovery and the Validation. Uh, it's a one-day course uh, where we talk about how we can use the product discovery in taking the better decisions as well. When we talk about the product discovery, we generally also talk about the double diamond of the product discovery. Uh, where First diamond talks about the problem space and the second diamond talks about the solution space. So you'll see first what we try to do, we try to discover the problem. For that, we try to understand our customers, their needs, their problem. And then we try to define those needs as well by exploring which are the right problem we want to focus on. Once that problem is defined, we explore multiple solutions. We build uh, prototypes, then we test those prototypes and see the which of these solutions fits best for the problem that we are trying to solve as well. And if you'll see, this is very much on the divergence and the convergence thinking. First, we want to see the lots of options, and then we want to do the pros and cons analysis, then choose the right one using the convergence techniques as well. But it is not as simple as it looks like. As you can see here, you are learning at each and every stage. When you're defining the problem, you learn. When you are developing the solution, sometimes you learn about the problem much better as well. When you are testing out, you are learning more as well. And this inspect and adapt is always happening even during this product discovery. And if I try to show this in a, a little bit clearer way, this is sometimes how it looks like. We are empathizing with the customers. Once we empathize with the customer, we learn about their problems, their needs, their jobs to be done analysis. Once we have done that, we look for the solutions, brainstorm the solutions, we build prototype, and then we test prototypes. What happens with this is when you sometimes you are building these prototypes, you learn about the customers as well. Sometimes when you are building those prototypes, you learn about the problems and the needs a little bit better. Sometimes when you're doing the prototype, you get more ideas as well. And the thing is, it is messy. Product discovery is not a linear process as well. And here I would like to share one of the real life examples. So uh, I am uh, currently working with an educational technology company uh, where what we try to do is we build LMSs. 
And uh, one of the problem that we are trying to solve was that allowing the students to able to validate their learning through multiple choice questions. That's the solution we had in our head. And when we were building out those prototypes, we really learned at that moment that we also have got another important user here, which is the course creators. And initially our idea was that course creator, they are going to create multiple choice questions one by one. And when we were running those tools, test, few course creators, they told us, come on, mate, do you really want me to create these questions one by one? And we got an idea at that moment that, oh, probably what we also need is we need a bulk upload feature through which they can upload the questions in one go itself. Yeah. What happened? We were built, we were testing out something else, but we got idea for something else as well. And this is what the thing that continue happening as well. It is not linear. It is not like if you do the step one, you will go to the step two, then you have to go to the step three. Sometimes you go back as well. Yeah, learning never stops. Learning is always happening. So Navanish, we talked about this before when 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 we were reviewing the, the talk and I love this drawing that you've created because a lot of the times those models, they look so so flat, right? So, so sequential. And um, there's some, there's some great comments in here about how it's almost like the same path of civilization. Um, one thing that I'm wondering about through a question um, that came in from our guests is, this is nice when we're thinking about what we're learning, right? And you're talking about the example of you working with your client. I am this client currently because I know that there's something and I should know better, but I, there's sometimes, how do you deal with that balance when someone says, Hey, I know what I want. I know it must do this thing, right? There's a requirement they give you right away. I will not engage with an LMS unless it can do this thing, right? And you're saying, hey, let's look for the evidence too. And your client's not going to hear that. How do you deal with that situation when we're talking about product discovery? Oh, that, that's a really good, great question, uh, Trish. And especially this happens a lot in, in the B2B environment where somebody's coming up with the requirements and say, hey, build this. And I think... Uh, how we can deal this thing is by educating those people by asking the right questions. Yeah. Don't just take it as a like, don't become an order taker. Gather their opinion as well. Okay, when you are giving this requirement to me, what gives you that confidence? I can get it. You are very confident about it. But from where that confidence is coming from, have you got a data? Can you share that with us? Okay. Or is it just two people have decided in a meeting room and you are, you have decided, are you ready to spend six months worth of work by just two, talking to the two people? And having that conversation, making them realization that guys, in you just can't build that much of risk. Let them have this understanding that experiments and the test, they are not for fun. They are the best risk mitigation strategy for not building something that nobody wants. Yeah, I think what you just said is really important, right? This notion of testing and this notion of an idea. Um, and I know you're going to talk about it more to learn about that, but the, to approach everything as a hypothesis. So somebody was asking, you know, what is evidence-based decision-making? And for me, that comes from evidence-based management. And that's really about the empiricism, really about how we work through things in an agile and scrum manner. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And everything is an assumption unless it's not goes into the customer or the user's hand. And this is where I can talk about one of the tool, which I uh, 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 love a lot. We talk about this in our both the PSU class and as well as in the PPDB, uh, the product discovery in the validation class, uh, where is that that learning must not stop. When you are uh, into the early stages and you want to understand whether this problem exists, whether that customer exists, okay? Those moments, you just don't want to do the A-B testing. Probably at those moments, you want to talk, you want to interview, you want to survey, you want to do those low-cost, cheap experiments and the test to validate the problem. Once the problem is validated, you want to validate the solutions, their feasibility of the solution as well, the usability of the solutions as well. 
through certain tasks like building the prototypes, feature fakes, and all those kind of stuff. And then you want to move towards that, okay, can you make a business out of it or not? Which is very much about the viability as well, where you would like to do the price testing, beta. And the thing is learning always happening. And just to explain this, I have got a simpler way to explain the truth curve as well, okay? So let me explain this now, okay? So the truth curve, uh, people, it has got two element. First is this x-axis, as you can see, which is talked about the level of effort and the investment required to run a test or experiment, okay? And this y-axis talks about is how much confidence, how much signal, how much evidence you get after running those tests or experiment itself. So if I take the simple example, if I'm talking, interviewing five users, and I, if I'm interviewing 20 users, interviewing 20 users synthesizing the results is going to take a little bit more time than the five. So this is why it will be towards a little right side. But because I have spoken to more people, that will give me a little bit more confidence as well. And this is where you can see it was going to be a little bit higher up than the five in interviewing the five people itself. But if I only and only thinking about the interview, I will start getting this diminishing return of investment as well, where I can interview 100 people, but the confidence and the signal which I'm getting may not be large enough as well. And this is where we need to look for the options sometime as well. So, and then it will start coming up something like this, where the more the investment, more the effort you're making, you want to gather more evidence as well. You want to ride on this truth curve. Learning never stops just by interviewing five people, by surveying itself. You need to learn at each and every stage, even after the release as well. Even if you release the product to the customers and the users, you need to gather the data, the data analytics and things like that to know whether it really delivered the value or not. Learning is happening at each and every stage. And how to use the test car, uh, this truth curve? Here is another simple example, okay? Because to validate your assumption, there are always options. So let's say you have validated a problem by interviewing the five users or the five customers. Then you think, okay, guys, let's, I want to validate some of my solution related assumptions, okay? Then you have got two options, let's say for an example, you have you can interview 20 people, something like the focus group kind of a thing, or you can also complement it with a paper prototype. And if both of them, they are taking the same amount of effort and paper prototype is giving you more evidence, logic says, which one will you choose? The paper prototype. But obviously here, one, I am I'm making very big assumptions that all the teams, they are ready to build the paper prototypes as well. I'm making an assumption that, yes, paper prototype fits in that particular context as well, which is not always right. Yeah, And sometimes this may look something like this, that, okay, you are interviewing five people, you are interviewing 20 people, you build the digital prototype, it can give you a little bit more evidence, you run the A-B testing, but can you see, I have also added the AB2 element of the AB testing here. And this is something happened uh, in reality uh, when I was delivering this uh, product discovery class. So I had one fashion industry brand. I asked them, oh, guys, where would you put AB testing in your environment? And what they did for one team, so I had 10 people, I divided them into the two teams. One team, they put the A-B testing towards very right. Another team, they put the A-B testing towards very left. And I was like, what the hell? You guys are coming from the same company. How the same technique could be one towards the right, another towards the left. And they said, the team that put it in towards the right, they said, oh, we none of our people, they are very skilled in the running the A-B testing. So pretty much we have to set up everything from the scratch and all. But whereas the other team, people, they were running the A-B testing for such a long time, they were quite skilled in, in itself. So which technique you choose very much depend upon the context. I cannot run A-B testing in all the scenarios. I cannot run paper prototype in all the scenarios. 
I cannot run the digital prototype in all the scenarios as well. And we need to apply that context, the skills available within the team, and choose the right experiment type based on that. There is no one size fits all. There are always options. Love, Anish, that's a great um, point. I just wanted to ask oh, if you actually go back one, one, um, one slide to the examples I use. So I, what I love here is that you're saying, hey, yes, we're going to interview users, but we can't make assumptions just because of what people say. So you talk about paper prototypes, A-B testing. Of course, we can talk about costs um, that are associated, what people are willing to take. Could you give an example of what a paper prototype might look like for an experiment? Okay, so let's say I have got these four screens, let's say for an example, Patricia, okay? And I bring some kind of wireframing and you are one of my user. And I say, hey, Trish, I have got these four data point. Which one is better for you? This, 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 and this. And you say, oh, lovely. I think this one need, fits my needs and the problem much better. Okay. So where would you click here, Trish? Here or there? I can build those lo-fi designs, lo-fi wireframe, put in front of the system, uh, uh, certain users and help them visualize. Because many times customers, they don't know what they want until they see us, see that thing as well. Building those lo-fi prototypes like the paper, paper ones help them visualizing their problems and the, their solutions as well, which is, I would say, if I talk about the Scrum language, makes the thing transparent for them, which help us in inspect and adapt better. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I, I give a couple of examples of this prototype in a moment as well. Yeah. So guys, remember, no one size fit all. There are always options. Explore those options as well. Look the skills that you have got in the team as well. Look the context as well. Those are the things that you need to see before selecting any experimentation type or any testing type as well. Okay. So what are we testing? So generally when we do the test, we are testing the three different kinds of uh, assumptions. So first is the problem fit. So where are we trying to understand whether that problem exists, whether that customer exists, we try to empathize with the user. And then once we have got, then we try to do the solution fit that what we can build as well. So this problem fit experiment, they help us in understanding our uh, desirability risks. The solution fit experiment, they help us in understanding the feasibility and also the usability related risks as well. And the market fit pretty much or talks about the viability that can we make a business out of it or not? Can we scale it further or not? And I'm going to go a little deep into all three of it now. So the first is the problem fit one, okay? So what the problem fit experiments are. So problem fit experiments, they help us in, uh, you can say, go into the psyche of the customers. Uh, understand their needs, the problems as well. And these experiments are one of the really great way in avoiding the waste of not building something that nobody wants as well. We make a lot of assumption that, oh yeah, this is what our customers want, okay? I have worked in some environment where they say, oh, it's a must have requirement from our customers. That must have is also an assumption from somebody and I can, Bet you, many of you must have delivered few must have requirements, which never got used by any of the customer and any of the users as well. Yeah. And this is something that we want to learn. We want to reduce our waste as well. And in uh, other language, you can say that, okay, problem, lovely. There is not always a problem. Okay, you can also use this language of opportunity. So this language also coming from uh, this great book, The Continuous Discovery Habit by Teresa Torres, where we use uh, solution, uh, tools like opportunity solution tree to understand the problem fit, then the solution fit, and then the market fit as well. So few examples of the solution fit is here. Yeah, user interviews. So where you go and talk to the customers, ask them certain questions. Generally, you try to ask them open-ended questions and they do give us a lot of qualitative insights. Whereas surveys, 
you can go to the mass. You can probably reach to the great number as compared to the user interviews, but they do not go quite deep into the qualitative analysis, but they are very good, especially if you want to do some kind of quantitative analysis as well. And then there are certain observational studies as well, where you go and see the problems the customers and the user are facing when they are using your product and when they are doing their jobs as well. So these are the kind of experiments in the test they can help us in understanding that jobs to be done analysis kind of thing as well. Yeah. And I have picked one of it because each of these things, they have got its pros and cons. I cannot apply user interviews everywhere. I cannot apply surveys everywhere as well. I cannot apply observational studies everywhere as well. So I have picked in interviews that, okay, what is good and bad about the interviews as well? So they are really good for the qualitative uh, understanding, but you would I will never do these uh, interviews, especially if somebody is using the interviews for the, for checking their bias. Our decision making is filled up with the biases like the confirmation bias and the resulting bias as well. And sometimes if you just want to use the interviews to check your biases, probably that's not the great way as well. Remember interviews are for the people, not about you. So please talk less and listen more. And maybe don't have a lot of close ended question. Do you want this feature? Probably you will get an answer like yes or no. What do you want to see is, okay, you are using this product. What problems are you getting as well? Yeah. And I'm going to give one quote from this book, which I was referring earlier, Continuous Discovery Habit by Teresa Torres, which is that, that the purpose of the customer interviews is not about what you should build actually. The customer, the purpose of the interviews is to understand their needs, problem, and something about learning about uh, what kind of jobs the customers and the users are trying to fulfill from the products and the features that we are building. So let me give you one real life example as well. So this example is coming from educational technology industry uh, where I worked uh, last year. So what our assumption was, uh, we started seeing that quite a lot of uh, course creators, they have started leaving our platform. And it started giving us some big problem. So we felt that uh, we believe that the 10% increase in the new customer acquisition will be achieved if the course creator will find it easier to market their course. That's what our assumption that maybe that's a problem with the marketing because it's not about ability to create the courses. It's all about the marketing. So to validate this assumption, what we did, we ran interviews. So we started interviewing the people who left recently. And uh, this is where one thing I would say is sometimes we feel that people, they do not want to talk. I always have experienced that if you try to reach out to the people, there are many people who are willing to talk and ready to spend some time with you. Okay, so we interviewed few people who left the platform and also the people who recently joined as well. And we started asking some qualitative insights from them. And uh, our learning from that has been that yes, they are not worried about that they are not able to create the content using the features that we have, like the videos, audios, and the assessments and the things like that the biggest problem they were facing was they were not able to sell to the uh, students and all. And significant, so I think we had somewhere around 80% of the people who said they left mainly because of that itself. And this is how we validate our assumption. Yeah, We didn't just start building that marketing features straight away. We validated that assumption and this also helped us in the prioritization as well. Because lots of the product managers, they were coming up with the features like AI builder. We want an AI course builder. But when we understand this thing that mate, probably at this moment for the product, ability to create new courses is not the big thing. What we need to help is we have to, we need to help our 
course creator ability to market their products and their content itself. And what we uh, had was in the six months time period, our acquisition rate not only increased, our churn rate also started going down because of that as well. Yeah. And I'm using this tool called Test Card, guys. Really great tool. And I really like the learning of it as well. But you can see that how critical these uh, assumptions are for you, how much is the test cost is, what is the data reliability. So I would highly suggest if you have not used it, at least try it. It is a really great conversation starter with your leaders and the managers. Okay, so next, solution fit experiments. Okay, so what these solution fit experiments are, they help us in uh, understanding how good the solution is. And they are really, really great in understanding the user experience, which are the places where the customer are facing the most problem as well. Where are the places where sometimes you can automate as well, okay? And because customers and the users, they can visualize the solution, they are able to provide us much deeper insights, which probably which we could not have get through something like the interviews and all. So different solution fit experiments I would like to talk about. So prototyping, building paper prototypes, okay? Building digital prototypes using tools like Figma. Again, Figma is just one tool, but there are certain tools using which you can create the clickable prototypes as well. You click on this, then this screen appears. You click on this, then this happens. This is all without building an actual product itself. You can do A-B testing where you don't know the whether customers, they like this kind of user experience or this kind of user experience. You run the A-B testing for a certain time period. You gather the result, you gather the evidence. Then you learn, oh, the people with this user experience, they find it much easier, much faster. And then what you do, you make and go ahead with this solution itself. Landing page experiments where you also uh, build and try to explain your features as well. And then you see that the way people interact and they engage with those pages, you validate your assumptions as well. Yep. And here I would like to give another example. Okay. Now this example is coming from one of the bank I used to work a few years back. Okay. Uh, so what we were trying to do, we were building certain systems uh, for their debt management team to address the cases that comes there. So we, be we believe, so our assumption was that the debt management team will be able to process more efficiently and they will be making less errors if the user journey is more simplified, more automated and more streamlined. That's what our assumption was. What we did using Figma, we built a multiple versions of the customer journeys. We didn't know which customer journey will work best. We had few debt management team members who, who were the part of that testing which we did. We ran out those multiple customer journeys with those debt management team members. And what we measured, we measured how satisfied they are in which of the journey they are taking more time, which of the journey uh, they are much more helpful as well. So it was very much like the assisted usability testing we did. And that helped us in choosing the right customer journey, which was giving the most satisfaction to our debt management team members. But it also revealed a lot of automation opportunities for us as well. So something which I was trying to say earlier that product discovery is not linear. Even though we were trying to validate a different assumption, but we also started getting a lot of new ideas for the automation to make the life of our users and the customers a little better as well. So we, wow. yeah. Lavanish, as you, as you made that comment, there were some actual, um, there's some questions that came in early. There's a lot of good questions I could actually, I'm trying to not jump in myself, but um, you just made a comment that it's not linear. So two things is, could you talk about this in relation to design thinking? Um, you know, the, the product, um, the product discovery um, experience that you're talking about. And then also, 
if you're working on a team and you're talking about this continuous learning um, and maybe even for a scrum team or not, how do you think about planning then? Because it, the way that it sounds, it sounds like you're just continuously, you know, throwing crap at the wall. So our ideas at the wall, uh, uh, thoughts at the idea. So, so can you talk a little bit about that in terms of design thinking and then also in terms of planning and learning? Uh, so let's take uh, one thing at a time, design thinking. I feel and strongly believe that design thinking uh, is augmented into the product discovery itself. What is design thinking? It is a human-centered approach, isn't it? Where we take the human approach where the customer is the center of every decision we make. And I think the product discovery is all about that. When we talk about this problem space, where we are trying to discover the problem and then define the problem, which actually talking about the first two stages of the design thinking, which is about the empathize and define itself. And then what we're doing is we are testing uh, the prototypes and learning from it. So design thinking and the product discovery to me, they are not very separate. They are very much together in and itself, where you are taking that human and the customer centric approach rather than making the decision based on finger in the air or the gut feeling. Design thinking help us in gathering the data as well, I think. And what was the second one? Trace. So you're talking about the integration of basically, you know, how we're learning and uh, product discovery, right? So the notion of how can you better plan when you're doing this, if it feels like you might just always be going back and forth. And for me, that's really the notion of empiricism and ins inspection and adaptation and building on what we're learning. So it's really, the question is really about planning and then it might even be about um, execution. Yeah. Is, is To me, one question that comes to my mind, is the bad thing that we are going back and validating our assumptions early itself? I think it's a good thing. Uh, uh, isn't it rich? So how we do this kind of thinking in something like, uh, let's say if I use the Scrum framework itself, product backlog refinement is a great place. Sprint planning is a great place. Can we add these kind of building these wireframe prototypes into the tasks of the product backlog item? Yes. And this is, I would say, the one of the core concept of our course, uh, Professional Scum with the User Experience, is that wherever possible, try to integrate this user experience, product discovery kind of thing within the one product backlog item. What I have seen in many places is they are trying to say, oh, we have got a design team that will do the product discovery. And then we have got the delivery team that will do the delivery. Now, once you do the design and then when you pass it over to the delivery team, sometimes there's a big gap and there's a big handoff and it creates a lot of waste. Design team, they're always trying to make the perfect prototype. And I can tell you, I have seen this. They try to make those pixel perfect prototypes and then hand it over to the delivery team. And then they see and say, oh, come on. You know, we cannot even build this thing as well. Yeah. So one thing that we need to see is that it should be the part of that truly cross-functional team where we have got skills of product management, design as well, and the delivery as well. Design and delivery needs to go together. And they I would add, I would add that something. So for me, I would add that there's really this notion of talking to the stakeholder. So um, there's some questions in here about how it's integrated into Scrum. And you've talked about essentially the, for me, a sprint is an experiment and we're discovering the whole times, but that doesn't mean that we're not executing. So in order to, to figure if something's working, we actually have to deliver something to see if it's valuable. And so for me, when we think about the goals, the sprint goal, the product goal, a strategic goal, um, those are all the things that we're testing against is that goal um, so that it's, it is going in, in one direction. And that might be something that can help people who are working with their, their clients or across industries. So. Definitely. Because when we think from the goal that you mentioned, Trish, like a sprint goal, product goal, 
we are talking more about the outcome oriented approach but if your product goal is guys let's deliver 100 story points by the end of the q1 that is not the goal for me yeah and this is something that we need to see as well that create those outcome oriented sprint goals product goals and automatically these things they will start coming in in our natural day to day talking and the working as well we need to talk about customers and the users at every point of time they should be the part of our uh, i would say uh, product backlog items i have so i have seen i give one more example trish that i have seen many organization they use personas they spend months and they create personas and after that those personas they eat dust in the confluence or the sharepoint site nobody ever uses them yeah and are we assuming that we know about our customers persona so well that they we never update them my big suggestion would be if you have got personas great use them in your product backlog item don't say as a user probably put as a admin user as a course creator as a learner okay start giving that life to those personas or whatever you using the more we will use it the better we will understand our customers and users their needs their jobs to be done and probably we can create the better products and the features that truly serves their needs and the problems and this probably i think brings that design thinking approach that we were talking about again put the customers and the users at the center of every decision what we make which eventually help us in gaining the business benefits as well Okay, uh, then again, uh, something about uh, the prototyping. Yeah, uh, briefly, uh, I can talk about that. Okay, yeah, they help us in visualization. Uh, we can see the things uh, and this visualization make the things transparent and we can do the better inspect and adapt. Uh, my personal suggestion always I do is, again, it's not a hard fact, but I always prefer to start with a low fidelity then move towards the high fidelity kind of prototypes as well and my experience again i found these prototypes really really helpful especially in validating the user journeys and the customer journeys especially if you are building some digital products i think prototyping can be really really helpful to understand the pain points the automation and help in building the products the right, uh, and identifying the right solution for that as well than market fit again as well okay and this is where probably i can talk about the one real life uh, product that we have built recently trish so so market fit what what market fit pro are so market fit we are learning uh, more about uh, uh, the whether we can make a business out of it or not so something like the price testing uh, you, we can do scalability testing and all and uh, few examples of it you'll see lacks a beta release recently scrum.org they have launched a new course guys if you remember product discovery and the validation okay and that course was uh, under uh, the beta testing for considerable amount of time what did we wanted to learn we didn't wanted to learn whether the course content is right we didn't want it to learn the whether there is a need of that kind of course or not probably that we have already validated by that time but when we went to the beta testing the key thing that we wanted to test was can we really sell it to our clients to the organizations will people adopt that uh, product as well or not and that's something that we wanted to learn through those beta testing as well i have built a uh, learning card which i can share with you uh, in a moment but there are other um, techniques that you can use for the market fit as well so in one of the organization uh, uh, so we were using this ad campaigns so we were running those ad campaigns and through those ad campaigns we were learning about that what uh, whether there is an enough market enough territories enough uh, uh, geographical location where this product can really work well or not there are places where you can also do the pre order pages so we build the pre order page and then you can learn about whether there is enough demand for this or not so i give another example of this uh, trish 
So two years back, if you know, this one tool was gaining a lot of traction, OKRs, objectives, and the key results. Two years back, I thought that I'm going to build a course purely focused on the objectives and the key results. And I will build an e-learning e course and all. I had a really idea about what I'm going to do that, but I was not ready to spend my, I would say, one month worth of effort to build that entirely new course itself. What I did, I put a pre-order page on my website called Mastering OKRs. I put a price for that as well. And for three months, I was checking that how many people they actually click on it and actually make an order. Three months, only three people clicked on that course on my website and nobody ever purchased it. What I did, I never launched that course on my own. I'm not saying that that kind of need is not there, but that kind of need is probably not from me. They might be going to somewhere else for that kind of course. Yeah, probably that was not the right audience for me as well. So again, I was trying to uh, show is that experiments are the best risk mitigation strategy, my friend, of not building something that nobody wants. Don't consider them as a fun only. Yeah. So a learning card I would like to show as well. So when I run the product discovery uh, and the validation uh, beta classes. So in one week, I run three classes with a completely three different kind of client. One was in the fashion industry. Another was the government industry. Another was in the advertising industry. So total 31 people, they participated in it. And we were asking a few questions was, guys, do you think this kind of course would be helpful for your other colleagues and within your environment? And we got 100% uh, result from that, that, oh, this is great. But we also learned something as well, especially the company where, uh, which was coming from the government kind of uh, environment. They said, oh, love niche, we love the, all the tools and techniques that we are discussing in this course. But your case study was very much into the B2C kind of thing. But we work in the B2B. So that person, he gave us uh, eight rating out of 10. Only person out of those 31 people. And, uh, but that feedback was so powerful for us. What I did afterwards, that whenever I am delivering any private class, especially in the B2B environment, I have created a B2B kind of case study as well so that they can correlate with it a little bit better. And that was the next decision that we took. What we're doing, even though the course is in the production, we still keep on learning. We learned that yes, this course does serve a great value to the audience. And you can see this course is already live now, guys. From 12th of September, exactly almost two months back, this course went live. Yeah. And it didn't go live just like anything, we actually practice what we preach. We went with the beta testing for that. Yeah. And I would like to conclude things with these five key benefits, which comes with the evidence-based decision-making. First, our decisions, they are filled with a lots of biases. Evidence-based evidence -based decision-making, evidence-based management minimizes those biases because data doesn't judge, yeah? And we are minimizing the risk, we are minimizing the waste, but they, what they also does is they build that experimental culture within the companies as well, where they can see that we can also run low cost experiments. Many leaders, they feel the experiments are all about big cost, and sometimes they are a bit, you can say reluctant towards it as well. But you can do the smaller experiments as well, learn from it, talk to the customers, run prototypes. It should be within our DNA, I think. Don't just make decision based on gut feeling only. <laughs> gather the data, gather the evidence. And I'm also open for some questions as well, if they are there. And guys, if you want to stay connected, you can join my newsletter later on as well. And uh, yes, I'm open for a few more questions. We have got five minutes, Trish. All right. Thank you, Avanish. Um, this was a 
a lot of information. There's a lot of great questions in here. Um, I'd encourage people to take a look at um, evidence-based management, which is where some of this thinking is from. So just a couple important things before we get into questions, Lavanish is, uh, Lavanish was talking about a course that we have called PPDB, which is about discovery and validation. That's actually an iteration on our PSU class, which is um, around Lean UX that was developed with Jeff Gott Health and Josh Seiden. So some of the techniques that you've seen that um, Lavanish has shared in, in today's um, in today's talk, there, there are tools and techniques that come from other places. We have some guests here that have pointed out, you know, the, the truth curve, right? That's based off of Constable's um, book where he talks about that. And Jeff Patton and uh, Jeff Godhelf have used those things. So those are all different techniques that people can use as they wish. But for me, they're really about talking points to have a conversation, dashboards, all those things that are coming through too. Um, questions there. It's about the information that is meaningful to what you're trying to explore. So um, we have a few minutes left. Um, here's an interesting question um, that I thought um, it actually might be, I don't know how you, how you would do it, but so how do you think about product metrics? What kind of metrics are you looking at when you have these 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 um, test cards that you're using. Mm, uh, I generally try to use one of the tools which you have created, Trish. Here, evidence-based management. So, so I try to see the things that okay, uh, things from this current value perspective. How would I know whether when I'm running this experiment that people are actually getting value out of it or not? So that could be in, in the form of the user satisfaction score or the adoption rate as well. But yes, these metrics for the experiment, they are going to be a little bit different than when you do the things into the production itself. But the most important thing here is whenever you run the experiment is what do you want to learn? What is your basic assumptions? Once we have got that understanding of what is our riskiest basic assumption, then comes the metrics. Remember, metrics are not the goal. Metrics are for the goal. Through so, the experiment, you want to learn, and that's where the metrics comes in. I think that's really interesting because I think of, for me, evidence-based management is on a high level of, we're using empiricism, what do we want to learn? Product metrics for me are additional to that. So if we have legacy products, if we have a startup, however we think of that goal, our product, uh, our product metrics, but we might be using metrics um, when you're running experiments or EVM that have nothing to do with products. Um, so, so that seems like uh, information that you can find on scrum.org. We have um, a whole slew of information on what types of product metrics to use. Um, all right, so I think my last question here is actual, <laughs> it's a great question um, that probably is gonna be more than two minutes, but in one minute, can you just summarize what you think about what you're talking about today and some of the misconceptions or assumptions people might have around this in dual track agile? You kind of talked about it, but if we can make that succinct. Uh, uh, I would uh, quickly say that guys, if you go and Google one of the uh, dual track agile is not the dual track agile article from Jeff Patton is a really great one. Probably it can give you more uh, uh, if you want to explore. But the thing is dual track was never supposed to be that you have got the design team and the development uh, as a two separate team. If you go read through, through that uh, dual track agile, it's all about that. Yes, there may be some item where which only requires a little bit of design. Yes, there may be some item which may require pure development, but majority of the thing should go through the design and development together. Design on its own probably add no value. Development on its own probably add no value. You want both together. Design help us in understanding the customer insights, the needs, the problem. Delivery make those ideas into the reality as well. And you need both of it. And that's what the key thing that we need to see. That 
dual track agile never supposed to be the two parallel tracks they are the combined track by the one team supported by one product backlog on that note thank you very much lavanish you can continue to ask him everyone uh your tough questions um or we'll find a different way to to contribute to this maybe do a follow-up but thank you very much lavanish thank you everyone for participating thank you well. thank you everyone <laughs>